All right, thank you all for joining us. Uh, for those of you who have not met us, my name is Mike Ryan. I'm one of the co-creators of NGRX, and I'm joined by Brian. Hi there, I'm Brian Love, a Google developer expert in Angular and web technologies. So today we're going to talk about something that I think is going to be new content for a lot of web developers. We're excited to talk about the art of reliability and how you can think about service level objectives for your web apps. So first, I wanted to find a couple of terms, because there's always definitions in a talk like this, and I just want to make sure that we're all speaking the same language. So first off, service level indicator. You're going to hear this term a lot today. A service level indicator is a carefully chosen monitoring metric that measures one aspect of your web app's reliability. Ideally, service level indicators should have a close linear relationship with your user's experience of their web app. And we recommend expressing them as a ratio of two numbers the number of good events divided by the number of bad events. We're also going to be using the term service level objectives. And they're tightly related to SLIs. A service level objective combines that SLI with a target reliability. If you express your SLIs as we recommended, your SLOs somewhere should be generally just short of 100%. For example, 99.9% .9 or three nines. And then this one is always most confusing, like users, customers, who are we really talking about when we think about value and trying to deliver a really great web app? So we're going to be using these two words interchangeably. I'm sorry, we just don't have the discipline to be more pragmatic about it. But for us, we have an expansive definition. Your users are anyone, internal or external to your company, humans, other companies, or automated systems. So users is a broad definition. There are lots and lots of users of our web apps. But customers are going to be the subset of users that are paying directly for your web app with real money. So we think, after all of our experience, that web apps need service level objectives. We want you to leave this workshop convinced that you should set SLOs for the web apps that you are responsible for, with a good understanding of how to do this in practice. And we believe this so strongly because it's, as quoted, difficult to do your job well without clearly defining what well is. And service level objectives are a mechanism to define what well means as software engineers building web applications. So Mike, I have a question for you. So I'm building this really fantastic web app. And I mean, I'm building these really sweet features that the users love. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're going to buy this thing, right? I mean, that, right. that is the most important feature for me to ship, right? Yes, that's right. That's, well, close to right. Features are important, but the most important thing for your customers is having a really reliable web app. The most important feature of any web app is for it to work, for users to be able to access it, and for it to be quick enough for the users who are using it to be able to get the stuff done they're trying to do with your app. So, okay, so I'm building this web app, and I'm, I'm, I'm building these really great features, and you're telling me that reliability is the most important feature. How do I... How do I balance these two things? They seem at odds to each other. Like I, reliability is one thing, but like building features, I have to move fast and maybe break things to build features. So how do I incentivize reliability? Yeah, that's a great question. Because as you already expressed, like you as a software engineer that think that features are the most important thing, I want right? to just build really cool stuff and ship it. Sure, and that makes a lot of sense. But if your app isn't available, users can't pull it up, and things are slow to load, it doesn't matter how good your features are. Because I'm not going to use it. I don't feel comfortable using it. And I don't think it's going to work for me. That makes sense. So how do we incentivize reliability? Well, it's not just enough to say that our web apps should be more reliable. Like, that's not going to do the trick. Our web apps aren't going to suddenly be faster or more reliable tomorrow if we just say that out loud. If that did work, you wouldn't be here. Reliability is a shared goal that many different parts of your organizations and teams must work toward. In many companies, it's common to separate the responsibility of operating the system mm -hmm. from the responsibility of actually building out the apps themselves. So for us, it's like, okay, I've been a software engineer at a company before, and you know, this web app, it needs to have features soon. Like My company needs us to deliver value to our customers as soon as possible because we're trying to be aggressive in entering the market. 
And so we've got, you know, all these practices that are helping me move faster on my team. My team's implemented Agile. We're doing Scrum every morning. Mm -hmm. We have push on green. So basically, as soon as my CI turns green, we're pushing directly to production, and things are really, really fast. But this is increasing the burden on the people that work at my company who are responsible for keeping that app running, right? Because I'm going so fast, I'm shipping so much code. The last company I worked at, we were shipping almost 15 times a day to production. Mm -hmm. We're shipping so regularly that they're getting really frustrated because if things start to degrade or there's outages, it's just kind of like chaos or trying to like throw a wrench in this really fast moving machine. So what ends up happening in a this kind of system, and this work happened at my company, is that the operations team starts getting like really boundary setting. They start setting up all these procedures to protect production environments from all this terrible outage-inducing change. Because me as a software engineer who's moving quickly is breaking things all the time, and they're tired of it, so they're trying to limit how often I can break it. And this is slowing me down, and I'm feeling frustrated as a developer, and they're feeling frustrated with me, and now we have contention inside of my organization. So to avoid this, in your organization, you need to find some way to incentivize the developers and operators of the system to find a good middle point between shipping new features and keeping the system running. So how do we agree on this desired level of, of reliability for a service? Yeah, we need to have a principled way to agree on exactly that. So you can't spend all of your engineering time on reliability because we do need to build new features. Reliability alone is not a good product. So the question you're asking is like, what does reliable enough look like for my web app? Shortly by like, how can I objectively measure the performance of my web app? And that's why we think your web apps need SLOs, service level objectives. We think of SLOs as a principled way to agree on the desired reliability of your web app. SLOs provide different parts of an organization tools to make this decision. We've claimed that reliability is the most important feature that you can ship, and for developers in the room, reliability work can get in the way of hacking on cool new features and meeting those crazy deadlines set by the product folks. Changing web apps is the biggest risk to their reliability and performance. So how can you strike a good balance between moving fast and breaking your system? Well, if you have a real-time measurement of your service's reliability, you can start to gauge the reliability cost of new code. You'll know when one of your changes or one of your shiny new features starts to hurt your customer's interaction with your application. And for the operations folks who are trying to keep this thing running, who are generally on the hook for the service's reliability, agreeing that some measure of unreliability is acceptable and even desirable mm -hmm. usually helps reduce the overall operational burden of running that web app. Rather than burning yourselves out fighting every small fire, you can carve out time on proactive projects that are stopping things from catching on fire in the first place. So for SLOs, they provide a common language and a shared understanding, anchoring your conversation about service reliability on concrete data. It's tempting to consider SLOs to be a purely operational concern, but for them to function correctly for your team, they need to be a signal for prioritization of engineering work. Your reliability targets must be set in conjunction with engineering and product teams. Everyone in your organization must agree that the target accurately represents the desired experience of your users. So what exactly does reliable mean, though, Mike? You keep saying reliable, 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 but like, what are we shooting for here? Yeah, so like, let's think about like Google or LinkedIn or Twitter or any of the apps we think of. And maybe if you're using Twitter recently, you've been thinking about reliability a good bit more. And you know, what should reliable look like? Like what should you be able to do? What characteristics of performance are important to you? And what are your expectations for how good it should be for your users? So if your service or web app has paying customers, you probably have some way of compensating them with refunds or credits when that service has an outage. These are called SLAs. Your criteria for compensation are usually different or written into these SLAs. And these are going to describe the minimum level of service that you promise to provide and what happens when you break that promise. So here in the room, I'm just kind of curious, works at a company that has SLAs or promises your customers some amount of uptime? OK, keep your hands raised if you have some way to measure that SLA. Yeah, very, very few, and that kind of matches our experience. I think there's like three people in the room, and most everyone else kind of put their hands down. So the problem with SLAs is that you're only incentivized to promise the minimum level of, so of service and compensation that will stop your customers from jumping ship to a competitor. Customers often feel the impact of reliability problems well before SLAs are actually breached. 
falling far short of the levels of service that keep your customers happy and contributing to a perception that your service or web app is reliable. So compensating your customers can be really expensive, so what targets do you hold yourself accountable to? When does your monitoring system trigger an operational outage? To give you the breathing room to detect problems and take remedial action before your reputation is damaged, your alerting thresholds are often substantially higher than the minimum level of service documented in your SLAs. SLOs, service level objectives, provide another way of expressing internal reliability goals rather than external reliability mm -hmm. goals. For SLOs to help improve service reliability, all parts of the business must agree that they are an accurate measurement of your user's experience, and they need to use them as the primary driver for decision making. Your customers probably don't need to be aware of them, but they should have a measurable impact on how your business is prioritizing changes. SLOs must have concrete, well-documented consequences, just like there are consequences for breaching SLAs. Just because they're internal doesn't mean we should treat them any less seriously. For example, slowing down the rate of change and detecting more or directing in more engineering effort towards eliminating risks and improving reliability will get you back into SLO faster. Operations teams need strong executive support to enforce these consequences and affect change in development practice. So when do we need to make our web apps more reliable? Well, one way of looking at an SLO is that it helps you answer this question. When do we need to make a service more reliable? But really the question is, where do we draw the line? Thus far, all we've established is that your SLO target should be substantially higher mm -hmm. than your SLA's promise. But this doesn't help many of the free services funded by advertising that don't have user-facing SLA's at all. Mm -hmm. So how reliable is reliable enough? How do we measure how far off that target we are? And what do we do for figuring out that we missed that target? It seems to me, Mike, like if I'm building an app, this thing should be reliable 100% of the time, like zero downtime. I think you'd be the most amazing engineer on earth if you could build a web app that had 100% uptime. Because the reality is 100% is the wrong reliability, tar reliability target for basically everything. I mean, maybe NASA. <laughs> Even I, then. <laughs> I mean, I would kind of <laughs> hope if I'm like getting in the shuttle, like I hope the reliability target for this puppy's we pretty hope, high. <laughs> we hope, and yet, right? Like it's unrealistic to actually yeah. achieve 100%. History shows us that no outage is avoidable, right? right? We can't get that far. So you might think that you want to set your target as high as possible, right? I want to have the best possible reliability. But no. The key realization that Ben, Ta ben Trainer Sloss, the person who gave us this quote, he's the VP of SRE at Google, mm -hmm. is that 100% is just the wrong reliability target straight up. This is like true for things like pacemakers, which people depend yeah. on for their health. Right. According to a paper published in 2005, the average reliability of a pacemaker was 99.6%. So 100% is not even achievable for pacemakers, and a lot of us aren't building things as important as pacemakers, just to kind of set that up. Depends on the app. I mean, my app's pretty, <laughs> pretty important. <laughs> so 100% is just the wrong goal, but how do we figure out what the optimal target is? For Brian and I, we've kind of come to the conclusion that we should try and be slightly more reliable than like the top consumer ISPs. Because in this case, like, let's be honest here, Xfinity is going to go out more regularly than my app. Or the Wi-Fi at the conference right? is just going to be like, meh, meh, meh. Right, like if I can do better than Xfinity, then when my app's down, maybe my users will be like, ah, it's, uh, it must be Xfinity it's my cable, down again. Right? Yeah, those cable like, companies. That's kind of roughly what I like to think about. It's like, let's compare ourselves to, to what ISPs are, and we all have home internet. We're probably all used to regular outages. So, we have a simple rule of thumb for where SLO targets should be that generalizes the case. A typical user of your service should be just about happy with the service when it operates to those targets. Like, if it were any less reliable than the targets we set, they would be unhappy. The SLO is just that fine line between me smiling when I'm using your app and me feeling a little frustrated. The challenge is quantifying and measuring that happiness because monitoring it directly tends to require the kind of invasive medical procedures that Elon would be funding, and I don't think we all want to be using those kinds of ways to uh, measure reliability. So instead, we need to think of different ways. You have to make sure that you're thinking about all groups of your customers, mobile, desktop, different geographies. We need to think about how the impact of an outage may not be spread equally, but SLOs are general aggregates across your user base. If one customer is getting all of your error budget, they'll probably not be happy. One particular group of customers that are meant to be treated differently than those that work at your company. And these are the ones that are working internally. 
you need to be careful with these internal users because they have insights into how the service is actually operating. And they have that insight that your external customers don't have. This may cause them to behave in unexpected or downright strange ways from the perspective of your service, especially if they're granted early access to new features for testing purposes. So as you start to think about SLOs, make sure you're delineating between your internal and your external users. So we want to measure our SLOs achieved and try to be slightly over the target, just slightly good enough for people to be happy with it. But we want to be really careful because we don't want to be too aggressive Otherwise, our users will start to depend on how performant our app is, right? Like, if things are so quick and I get really used to it, then I'm going to be upset when things get slow. But if I was just always slow, if my web app was always slow but still made me happy, then me as a user, I'm not going to come to depend on the performance of it. I'm going to be okay with that slowness forever. So it's kind of weird, right? I think as engineers, we always want to go make the fastest, most performant thing, but that can actually really hurt us in the long run because if our users start to depend on fast and then suddenly we have features or changes we need to make that might slow it down, even if that slowdown would totally make everyone happy, your original customers start to become frustrated because they're perceiving that slowdown. So this barely met thing is really important when you think about performance. So if we're not targeting 100% reliability, for whatever target we do set, that needs to let us implicitly allow for a small amount of errors to be served to users, right? If I'm doing 99%, then I'm allowed for 1% to be wrong, right? I'm allowing for 1% mm -hmm. of my errors mm -hmm. to occur. For example, if you set three nines targets, so 99.99%, that means you can serve one error in every 1,000 requests to your users. Or in terms of like complete downtime, your service can be unavailable for a little over 40 minutes in a four-week period. So that's giving us some room to like have errors, have outages, and we call this our error budget. So figuring out how much budget you have available from a percentage reliability target means specifying a time window for the events your SLI is measuring. For Brian and I, we've often used fixed quarterly SLO windows for reporting purposes. So like every quarter we'll kind of report out for our clients what the overall performance was. And we've seen this pattern at many of our customers too. The problem with fixed calendar-oriented windows is they refill your error budget in one large mm -hmm. step as the window rolls over. It's so like every quarter, we'd get this huge amount of time in our error budget right back to us. And this makes these kind of unsuitable for operational purposes. Your customers are still going to remember yesterday's massive outage on the first day of a new quarter, but your budget has been reset, so everything's fine, right? Mm -mm. No, they remember it, and they're still upset, right. and so there's still something that's worth fixing. Instead, Brian and I recommend using shorter rolling windows to drive decisions about operational priorities. Cloud services use a 30-day rolling window, but we generally recommend 28-day rolling windows for new SLOs. And the reason for this is that it's exactly four weeks. There's no variation introduced by having like five release days within your window when you're doing weekly software releases, or five weekends within the same window. With a fixed, rigid four-week structure, we're using very short-term rolling windows, like one or 12 hours to drive alerting. If you burn multiple hours of error budget within an hour, you can be relatively certain that operational response is necessary. Once you've decided that time window, you count the number of events within that window. Multiplying this by the SLO target yields the absolute minimum number of good events that must be served within the window to meet the SLO, which in turn tells you the allowable number of bad events, right? This is your error budget. When you subtract the actual number of bad events, you know how much error budget you have left. This is a key signal to feed into project planning. So like when you're setting up your next sprint, you know kind of what you need to do within that sprint. If you have plenty of budget to spare, you can take more risks and move faster. But if you've already used most of your error budget, that's a signal that you need to start prioritizing and fixing those pesky bugs mm -hmm. instead of shipping cool new stuff. If you're way over budget, your users are unhappy, right? Because the SLO is that fine dividing line. So if you're over SLO, like way over it, they're not happy with you, and you need to start urgently reacting to trading feature velocity for reliability work. Okay, so I've got this budget. You're calling this an error budget. And That's right. I'm allowed to just kind of spend this. Like, what am I going to spend this on? Do I just like shut down the servers and like save some money on my AWS bill? I mean, what do I do? Yeah, so if we've got this budget to spend, we can be really smart about it. And there's so many different things we can spend our error budget on. 
So for Brian and I, we've observed that the two biggest factors that burn error budget are software releases, because those tend to go wrong, mm -hmm. or they introduce like planned downtime, and configuration changes. This is why we often recommend that like, a reasonable consequence of burning all your error budget is to slow down or even completely stop making non-essential changes to your web app until the service is back in SLO. Because if it's updating it that's causing outages or changing configurations causing outages, if you just simply stop releasing or changing the configuration, then for a large majority of outages, you're going to kind of start to avoid them. Of course, sometimes things just break, and it's a good idea to make sure you keep some of Slack in your budget allocations to account for emergencies and unforeseen circumstances. So if you have to take a web app down for essential maintenance, you can pay for it with downtime from your error budget. Though if the downtime is communicated enough in advance, your users will be expecting it, and therefore they'll be less happy about it. Lastly, there's a few other things you might want to spend some of your budget on. Like you could spend it to release new features where you know mm -hmm. there might be some big risk of outage. You can do it, use it for expected system changes. You need to leave some for inevitable failure in hardware networks. I mean, there's an AWS outage today that impacted Brian and I in the middle of our workshop. So you've got to plan for that sometimes. And then you have your own planned downtime. But there's also the ability to do like risky experiments with this, right? Ooh, if you have fun. some error budget, you could, if you wanted to, start to play with your SLOs. Like, hey, if I push this, if I make this slower, do people really get unhappy or not? And you can use this to start feeding it back into your SLO process. So there's a bunch of benefits to error budgets. I'm just going to go over these really, really quickly. But these are just a common incentive for developers and operators to find the right balance between shipping new features and keeping things stable. Dev teams can manage risks themselves. They decide how to spend their error budget. Developers are empowered to look at this budget and say, OK, this is how I want to spend my time this sprint working on new features. Unrealistic reliability goals become super unattractive really quick with error budgets. These goals dampen the velocity of innovation. If you have these really lofty goals, then your error budget's so thin that you're going to spend most of your time working on reliability. Mm -hmm. That's going to be a good signal to you that, hey, I'm spending too much time on this. This is unreasonable. We need to change things. My favorite, and this happened at my last company, is dev teams become self-policing. So like, I just remember a senior engineer being like, OK, we spent too much of our downtime on this particular feature. We need to fix it. And it was really great because it came from an engineer on the team rather than our manager or our manager's manager, our product manager. or our, our great, great grand boss, as I like to call the manager's manager's manager. <laughs> and so there's just a really great self-policing tool that comes into play with these. It also means that we share the responsibility for system uptime. Infrastructure failures eat into the error budget, right? And we all want to keep things working correctly. We all have a shared responsibility towards it. OK, so how do we choose a good SLI for our web apps? Well, our happiness tests say that an SLO should represent the dividing line between happy and unhappy users. But we can't measure that happiness directly, right? So we have to find some way of approximating the happiness of our users with metrics we can directly measure. We start by restating one principle. Users become unhappy when the service they're trying to use doesn't behave the way they expect it to. Reliability is the number one goal. This means that if you want to understand the reliability of your web app, you have to measure the performance from the perspective of your users. You need to know what your user's actual experience is with that web application. It doesn't matter if it's your database being down, or your load balancer sending requests, mm -hmm. or a faulty piece of JavaScript that got shipped to production. From the user's perspective, they're thinking, hey, this app's not running anymore. This isn't working correctly, and now I'm sad. Similarly, it doesn't matter which component of the system is overloaded. The user's complaint is, this web app is slow, and now I'm sad. I want to stop using this web app. It's just not working correctly. So if we can find a way of quantifying the web app does not load, or the web app is slow from our monitoring data, we can tell how unhappy our users are in aggregate. So here's our goal. We want to distinguish between good and bad metrics. To show how this works, let's consider the interval highlighted in red, in which we know our users were unhappy, because we saw how many support requests started coming in during that time. You might be wondering, why can't we use requests for support as an SLI? And there's a few reasons for this. First off, it's a trailing indicator. Like, users have to be really pissed off to want to send a support request. I personally, I have too much anxiety to call support help ever. And so I never pick up the phone or submit that ticket. I'm just too anxious for that. So I just stop. I abandon your web app. I just, and, I just cancel. Yeah, I'm just like, done. Like, nah, I'm done. I'm as out. As few humans as I can talk to about saying this sucks, 
that's the best for me. Yeah, why am I gonna like go through this? Like, I'm gonna like s submit a support ticket that your web app sucks. I mean, yeah, I'm no, just, I'm out. that's not for me. I'm yeah. sure there's there's some people out there that do that, and y'all sure. are saints, and I appreciate <laughs> everyone who does take the time to send a support request. I'm just not me. And so it's a bad indicator because a lot of users aren't going to do it. They're going to stop using the service before they actually submit the support request. And by the time they've sent in a support request, they were probably really upset with you. So let's not use support requests as our SLI. But if we have a really good monitoring service, we can collect a lot of data about our web app. So maybe we can see how some of our changes during this period which we got a lot of support requests were uh, being affected, how some of these measurements were changing as these came in. And if we have measurements for how our web app is performing or how reliable it is, and we can correlate it to this red period, then we have a really great metric to use as our SLI. So which properties make it good for use as an SLI? Let's assume we've measured our web app somehow, and we've come up with these two candidates. If we had to choose between them, which one would we say is good, Brian, and which one would we say is bad? Well, the one on the left has a lot of variance, and there's a lot right. of noise in there, and exactly. maybe even some false positives, whereas the one on the right, like, that's a good indicator here. You got it dead on. So if we take a look at the one on the left, like Brian said, there's a lot of variance that's obscuring this metric. Things are going up and down, both in our good period and in our bad period. Whereas the one on the right, the, the metric gets worse with the outage. Right? There's not a lot of variance here. We can see that, hey, this thing's just a little bit lower while we're getting a lot of those support requests. So the one on the left provides a really poor signal-to-noise ratio. Like, if we were to try and do some thresholding here, we wouldn't really be able to say when was it working and when wasn't it mm -hmm. working. The window's just too big to get a good read on what outage means. Whereas the metric on the right, we can set and implement like a really simple threshold, right? We can say, hey, if this metric falls below this line, something's wrong, our users might be sad. And if it's above this line, things are probably working out pretty okay. So when we're thinking about metrics and we're looking at all the data that we're collecting as we instrument our web apps, we wanna try and find metrics that look a lot more like the ones on the right. Once we have our SLI, we then need to choose a really good objective to apply to that SLI. And I think you already told us, a good SLO is the fine line between happiness and unhappiness. That's right. Once you're sure you have a good SLI, one that has a close, predictable relationship with the happiness of your users, what reliability target should you set? How do you figure out where to draw the line? And to answer that, you kind of need to start to talk to some of the business folks. Mm -hmm. Like, what performance does the business need? The ideal is that your reliability targets reflect the needs of your business. As we said earlier, being too reliable has a cost. If your service is amazingly reliable, but your users would be happy with two nines because its failure modes are acceptable, maybe that means you can take more risks and ship features faster. Not being reliable enough, on the other hand, is often more costly. What if the only thing keeping your users with you is that your competitor's reliability is worse than yours? Well, in the minute that a good competitor comes out with better reliability, your customers are gonna jump ship. So we call SLOs based on business needs aspirational SLOs, because it's entirely reasonable for you to not be able to meet them initially when you set them. Over time, with some engineering effort, this is the service level availability for reliability that your operations team, you as engineers, and your product and executive functions want to reach. These represent your best guesses at what level of reliability is right for your web app. Customers and businesses over the long term are gonna try, strive to reach that particular SLO. We've said this a couple of times, but I really want to reiterate it. User expectations are strongly tied to past performance. This is like a really, this comes straight out of the UX rule book if ever there was such a thing. So if you have historical data on how good your web app is running right now, if you've somehow managed to get some performance data or some reliability data, that should be the data you use to set SLOs today. Because your users are already expecting your web app to work mm. as well as it already is. So if you have the data, use that data to inform a good SLO. We call SLOs based on past performance achievable SLOs, right? Because the SLO threshold you set, you're probably already meeting if you're setting it based on your current data. And you're gonna set it so that you know that you can expect to meet it most of the time. This is different from those aspirational SLOs that we can't quite meet yet, but we want to get to one day. So the difference between these two targets is a useful signal. If the business needs better performance than your web app is currently providing, that's kind of a problem. But it's common for there to be some divergence when you're just setting out on your SLO journey between these two. 
Another thing, this isn't like a, hey, let's all get together and pick some SLOs for my web app and then we're done. These are things that get continuously improved as you continue to develop new features, talk to your customers, measure, monitor your web app. What we need is some way to drive convergence between our aspirational SLOs and the ones that are based on our actual data over time. Aspirational SLOs are best guesses at, right? They're best guesses at best of what your business thinks makes your users happy. And achievable SLOs are what you're already doing today. So to validate these two assumptions and get them to drive closer together, you need to find some external signals that indicate that happiness or discontent of your user base. So maybe that's when you do start to look at support requests. But like if you're building a really public facing web app that has lots and lots of users, maybe you can go look and see what people are saying about you on Twitter or on forums, for example. Like you can go see what users are saying about it. You can even pick up the phone and talk to your best customers directly and ask them what they think of it and how things are working. Understanding discrepancies between these signals of user happiness and your SLOs, particularly instances where users were sad, but you were still in SLO, will help you refine your SLO targets. Significantly over-improving your SLO means that you have error budgets to spend. Maybe you could safely take more risks. Significantly underperforming your SLOs, on the other hand, means that you're taking too many risks. Or if your users are happy, maybe you should just relax your SLO targets. When you're just starting out, Checking your SLOs against these signals more frequently is a good idea. You should be checking in regularly on Twitter, forums, your customers directly, and see, hey, do these actually match whether my users are happy or not? You don't want to wait a whole year to find out that the first shot at setting reliability targets was way, way off. Mm. As you gain more confidence that your targets are in the right place, you can revisit them less frequently. But we recommend doing so at least once a year. A lot can happen in a year. User bases can grow, grow dramatically. They can increase, decrease. Your business might pivot to new markets or different requirements altogether. So revisiting them at least once a year is a good first step. Finally, the best objectives measure the user's experience. If we can find some way to actually measure that the performance and reliability from the perspective of our users, we're going to have the best possible data to make informed decisions about the reliability of our app. So let's take a look at an example. I have a reference architecture here for a web app. And in this web app, it's like a, it's like a real-time feed of food reviews in your city. I'm from Portland, Oregon, and it feels like we have a new restaurant opening up every other hour. And trying to keep your pulse on what new food places you should go eat to is an experience all in and of its own in Portland. Like there's full Instagram accounts that you have to follow to try and stay up to date with it. And so this web app is going to change the game. My customers in my web app can log into it and they can see real time food reviews coming in all across the city. And to build this, I've got a fairly simple system architecture. There's a load balancer that's serving up the Angular assets, the HTML, the JavaScript, the CSS, any of the images. And then that Angular application is talking to a WebSocket server for real-time updates and a GraphQL service server to pull data in from. These two servers are communicating to Redis and DynamoDB for storage and real-time events. And there's a lot of like background processing that has to happen with this much real-time data. So I also have this batch processing pipeline running on in the background. So for me, as I'm thinking about this web app, for me, the most important thing that I want to do is I want to pick a user story in it to start setting SLOs against. And for every good, important user story that I come up with, I want to pick like two to three SLOs for that vital user story. Two to three objectives that are going to tell me whether or not for this user story if I'm doing good work or not. So for me, I think the most important user story for my web app is loading the food reviews. Like I want my users to be able to open up the web app, log in, and they can see the feed instantly with recent food reviews. If they can't do this, or if this is slow, or if this sucks, my users aren't going to be happy with my web app. They're going to stop using it, and I don't want that to happen. This is my most important one, so I want to find some way to measure whether or not my users are happy with loading food reviews. And y'all, loading food reviews, even though the architecture was kind of simple, it's still super complicated if you think about it. Because in order for the users to open up the web app, sign in, and get there, there's so many different things that happen between the web browser, Angular, my framework of choice, the CDN, and the various servers that my web app is speaking to. First, the browser has to go fetch all that static JavaScript, CSS, and HTML from my CDN, and that has to get loaded to the browser. Then I need to route the user to slash feed, and the framework's going to take over that, right? The Angular router is going to take over once it's bootstrapped and kind of parsed out the URL. And because I've 
you know, done some content loading and I'm trying to be really smart about the performance of this, this typically means I need to go fetch even more JavaScript for this route. So I'm making another trip back to my CDN for some static assets. Finally, my framework has enough of the JavaScript to render all the Angular components needed to render the feed, the food review feed. But that's not enough because really I'm just showing a spinner. Now my Angular services are going to take over and they're going to reach out to my GraphQL service to load all the data for this. And so if you think about it, like there's a lot that's going on. A lot of my system is involved in trying to get the user to a place where I'm showing them food reviews. It requires a lot of, I don't know, let's say like magic to happen between the JavaScript you wrote, the framework you're depending on, the CDN you've chosen, and the way you've deployed your servers. If we take this user journey and map it back out to our system architecture, all the ones in purple are the things that are being impacted by this user journey. In order for a user to actually log in and get to the food reviews, I needed for the load balancer to work, for the WebSocket server to respond, for the GraphQL server to respond, for Dynamo to have been up. I needed for all the JavaScript I shipped to the browser to run correctly without any runtime or major runtime problems. I need my frameworks to all work cons considerably well. There's a lot to test here. So what do we do? Well, I'd recommend two SLOs for this particular user journey. And one's going to be based around availability, and the other's going to be based around latency. So availability means that the feed page for all the food reviews should load successfully. Like when the user logs in and gets there, it should actually show them the food reviews, not an error card, not an infinite spinner. It should show them the food reviews. And latency isn't about the success, it's about quickness. Not only should it eventually show them food reviews, it should do it reasonably fast. So I have these two targets or these two goals for this journey. How do I actually start to turn this into a real objective? Well, for availability, how do we define success? And where is the success and failure recorded? Like if I'm starting to measure success and have a definition for it, where is that recorded at? And for latency, how do we define quick enough? Like what does it mean to get to the food reviews quickly? Where, when does the timer start and when does the timer stop? So for availability, in terms of success, the proportion of valid requests are being served successfully. That's what we're going to say. We want to say that the proportion of all the requests that it took to get to the point where we're showing that page, those should be served successfully for our web app to be available. And the proportion of valid requests should be served faster than some threshold. That's how we're going to define latency. So I'm going to reward this a little bit for us as Angular developers. I'm going to say that the proportion of page loads for the slash feed page should be rendered successfully. Like by the time we actually show the content, everything that happened there should be success. Whether or not I showed that feed is my stopping point for availability. Once I get there, I've hit success. Similarly, the proportion of page loads for that component should be faster than some threshold. I should get to that component being rendered with real data faster than some threshold. So we're going to focus on success for availability and speed for latency. And how do we get that? Well, we're going to measure these at the web app. I'm going to measure how often I'm showing an error component on that feed versus how often I'm actually showing the Angular component that renders the food reviews. And similarly, I'm going to start the timer as soon as JavaScript starts executing on the page. And I'm going to stop that timer as soon as I actually got to the point where I was showing those food reviews. So how do we do that as Angular developers? Well, that's where Polaris comes in. So Mike and I are really excited to introduce Polaris to everybody here at ng-conf. One of the things that Mike and I have learned is we've been working with a lot of teams over the years, whether Angular or React or, or whatever, and we've learned that eventually all teams that are building web apps will eventually suffer something that we call reliability hell. And we know what reliability hell kind of looks like because there's a path towards reliability hell. Just like an API, it doesn't just die one day. It usually degrades before it actually dies. And the first thing that we notice with reliability hell is we start to get slow loading times. Things are just not quite as fast as they were when we, when we first shipped that feature or that application. The next step towards reliability hell that we've observed in the real world is that customers are starting to experience some sporadic error messages. Like Things are generally still working, but once in a while, they get the old, oops, we don't know. Try again. The next step is we notice that 
unreliability starts to manifest itself as customer service events. And Mike's talked about this. Sure, it's kind of a lagging indicator, but eventually somewhere someone goes, I don't know why this isn't working. I should probably call somebody or I'm paying for this, darn it. Like they need to fix this. Like, come on guys, what the heck? Why is it not working? It used to be great. The next thing that we notice on the path towards reliability hell is that your web app is just frequently down. Users are frustrated, things aren't working. Not only are your users and your customers frustrated, but the dev team is frustrated, the ops team is frustrated, everybody's just fighting and trying to figure out what the heck is happening. And that's when we know that we've landed in reliability hell. And what Mike and I have learned over the years is that apps with low reliability, eventually they degrade user trust. Think about how, tr how important trust is in your relationships, whether that's with a significant other or a friendship or even something like Google or a web app that you rely on every day. When you start to degrade user trust, that's when you're really starting to notice that, hey, we need to do something here and we're not sure what to do. And that's why we're really excited to announce here at ng-conf that we've built a solution called Polaris. And the goal of Polaris is to help, uh, help you build apps that people trust. Okay, so I found out I'm in reliability hell. I don't know what to do. How do I get out of here? And one of the things that we've learned is we've talked to customers from Fortune 100 to startups that are just getting started and launching their product. And it takes months, sometimes even a year or more, to actually crawl out of reliability hell. That was me. <laughs> you know exactly what it's mm -hmm. like. It's painful, and it's not enjoyable for the dev team, the customers, and, and everybody that's involved. And so crawling out of reliability hell generally has three phases to it. The first phase is we have to skill up. Your engineers, your ops people, you gotta go to conferences, read the SRE book from Google, and you gotta really figure out like, what is reliability all about? How do we solve this challenge? The next thing that we do is we have to go out and evaluate the tools out there. And there's all sorts of tools that you could go and look at. Some are really expensive and some are not expensive. So you need to start to evaluate what do we need? What can we afford? You know, who's gonna sign off on this really expensive thing? Do we really need that? We don't know. And it takes time to figure out like, what are the tools that are available for us? Maybe even you are like, hey, we're gonna build our own tool like Google has. The last thing that we learned is that teams have to then take all that knowledge and those tools, and then they have to put it all together and integrate it into their web apps. In all, crawling out of reliability hell, it's just really expensive, and frankly, teams just lose development velocity to reliability hell. And that's where Polaris comes in. Polaris helps you measure the reliability and performance of your web apps in real time with your real users in production. We integrate with incident response tools, whether that's PagerDuty, Jira, Data, Datadog, Slack. Slack, whatever it is that you integrate with. We don't do incident response, we do incident detection and outage detection. Plus, come on, we need AI. Everything needs AI these days, right? This 2023. <laughs> Uh, so AI actually makes a lot of sense with a tool like this because you might not be a site reliability engineer. You're a web developer and you're building a really cool product and reliability, yeah, it's the most important feature that you're shipping, but maybe you need a little help. And that's where the Polaris AI comes in and that helps makes the, in, the make, makes the integration a snap for you. To get started with Polaris, you npx a getpolaris.ai slash install and we'll help you get started from there. Out of the box, Polaris is going to measure the core web vitals. So that's largest contentful paint, first input delay, and cumulative layout shift. We're going to measure those, and we're going to send those up in real time, so that way you're getting insight into the performance of your web application. And listen, like core web vitals, for some people, really important, but we also know that like for some apps, like core web vitals just don't matter, and like, are we ever really going to re like achieve these things? Like, let's be real. So what we know is that you need to be able to measure anything in your web app. So with Polaris, you can measure whatever it is that you need to measure. We've learned that a lot of SaaS companies, like measuring the sign-up flow for their web app is really important. Let's say you've spent all this marketing money, you've got users that are landing on your website, they, they, you know, they chose the plan, they've punched in their credit card, and they go to hit submit, 
and then your API is slow. Worse, it fails. So we need to be able to measure the success rate and the duration of that API, so that way we can build SLIs and SLOs around that. So with Polaris, we made this super simple. There's just a function. You call measure, give it an event name, you could pass in some metadata along with it, and then do whatever you need to do. If it's successful, call done. If it fails, call fail. And then we can build SLIs and SLOs, monitor your web app in real time, all the time, and let you know when you're not achieving your SLOs. Those measurements are sent up to the Polaris Cloud, and we're going to measure those in real time for you. Um, and you'll use, use the Polaris uh, SDK that I showed you to make that happen. Now, I know, wait, 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 you're probably thinking, right, Mike, you're like, hold on. You better okay, not slow okay. me down. Listen, I got these market, the marketing team, I got a Google Analytics, I got this, I got that. I mean, I look at my bundle size these days, like, what the? How am I supposed to achieve Core Web Vitals, let alone any sort of performance in my web app? And now you're telling me you're a performance company, and you want me to install more JavaScript on my web page? Like, jeez. So when Mike and I set out to do this, one of the things we put on the whiteboard was the Polaris JavaScript SDK has to be super tiny. And we've done that. The Polaris SDK gzipped is just seven kilobytes. And it's non-blocking. It's going to stay off the main thread. So that way, your performance monitoring tool is not hindering the performance of your web app. After that, once we start gathering all your metrics and your data, we can start to see in real time how you're achieving against those SLOs. Like Mike taught us around uh, how we build our SLIs and our SLOs, you're going to define those objectives in the Polaris web application uh, based on your performance indicators. So you set those all up, and we're going to monitor everything for you in real time. Now, in the event that something does happen, you need to be notified immediately. That's what we mean by real time. So Polaris, once an event is triggered, an incident or an outage happens, we're going to reach out via webhook, and you can hit any of your favorite tools, whether that's Slack, Jira, PagerDuty, whatever it is that you want in order to manage incident response. Finally, we're really excited about this. The Polaris AI is your personal SRE. Like You don't need to go out and hire an SRE team. With Polaris, We've built an AI tool that's going to help you to conquer site reliability for your web app. The Polaris AI is going to automatically recommend indicators and objectives for you based on your measurement data. We're going to give advice on improving those objectives. And like any good AI, you've got to be able to talk to the thing. So you can chat with it and get some help on um, some guidance around your site reliability. And so Polaris is uh, up and available. We're going to be out in the hallway. We'd love to talk to you if you're interested in learning more about this uh, product that we've built. And we'd also love to talk more about SLIs and SLOs and how you can make your web apps more reliable. You can also check us out online at getpolaris.ai. And thank you so much for your time. Thank you.